So, current diagnosis, back pain, sciatica, we're going to stay just with the lumbar spine today. Our diagnostic techniques, our philosophies, our thoughts about back pain, they all come from, or are derived from, studies of inert anatomy and inert MRI scans and the treatment of patients while they're anaesthetized. And I'm going to be very provocative and tell you that this has led to a number of ill-founded <coughs> concepts. And I believe that the answer really lies in more secure diagnosis derived from patient feedback and aware state surgery. So we're coming at the patient not from behind the patient or through their tummy, but transferaminally. Now this is a fairly new little video, and it did start out a week ago like stars, Star Wars, and I wish the procedure was quite as simple as this, but we are using a laser to cut away the scarring and the bone and ligaments that are trapping the exiting nerve root through the foramen. And that last ligament is the superior foraminal ligament, which cannot be accessed easily from midline approaches. And therefore, midline approaches tend to under-treat the problem at a foramen. And this is what you see when you get in there. It looks even worse on that screen <laughs> than in real life. But the nerve is there. If I can get it to work. Ah, OK. So the nerve is actually there and there, covered by scarring. And believe me, the facet joint is there. And the other facet and pedicle is here. And after quite a little time, we've excavated the area, removed the scarring. You begin to see the bone here of the facet joint. And this is the beautiful nerve, still covered to some extent by the superior foraminal ligament. But now the protection of epidural fat is coming through from the epidural space in patients who haven't had previous surgery, that is, to continue to protect the nerve. And this, of course, is the dorsal root ganglion. It's just, the nerve is just beginning to swell into that. Having worked some time in France, uh, we tend to christen this ligament as Madame de Guillotine, because as you lose disc height, of course, that ligament starts to impinge further onto the nerve and cause irritation, and is often found bound to the nerve. So when you've done an effective clearance, we're be getting some color bleeding here today. Here's the epidural fat coming through. Here's the nerve. Now, the nerve should be a pale color similar to the, the walls of this room. Here, after the constant irritation, you will see that it's very inflamed and red. And just to show the brutality that I get up to in my spare time, here, this is the nerve running across here with its lovely little vessel on the top. I've spent some time clearing away the scarring on the top. Here's the superior foraminal ligament. But what that's showing is that the disc, which we've stained blue, is very soft and protruding, and that the nerve was adherent to that billowing disc. And if you leave it like that, you're going to have ongoing symptoms. So what have we learnt from patients over the last 25 years? That back pain, surprisingly, comes from the nerve. I think we've all grown up believing that back pain actually comes from the disc. Well, when we were touching that nerve, the patient was complaining of back pain. If you press more firmly onto the nerve, then you'll produce pain that radiates down the leg. But not always in the territories that we were learning about in medical school. There seems to be a lot of crossover. For instance, I can produce S1 nerve symptoms at the L4-5 level. And equally, I can produce so-called sacroiliac joint pain by touching the L3-4 level or L5-S1 or sometimes L4-5. So, Yes, you can get physical compression of the nerve, and that will produce neurological dysfunction. But 
the disc may produce irritative breakdown products which inflame the nerve and produce symptoms which are further enhanced by several methods of impaction in that foramen. And all of it's magnified or amplified by foraminal tethering. Then there is true discogenic pain. Sometimes you touch the disc and it's highly inflamed. You can see that there are injected vessels as angiogenesis in the wall of the disc. But in our patients, it's only about 11% of them can you reproduce that. I think you're all thinking about, oh, discography. Discography causes pain. That's surely the cause by the disc. No, discography distorts the disc and then presses on the nerve and then causes your nerve-derived pain. So high-intensity zones, which are dismissed, I'm afraid, by a lot of colleagues, are a source of very severe pain sometimes because the breakdown products are very noxious. Then there's another group in which the breakdown products actually produce scarring. And then there's another group in which they get both, unfortunately, the scarring and the pain but thankfully, there's a small group where the high-intensity zone doesn't cause any pain, probably because they're not making the right sort of horrible products. And again, those products coming out produce the tethering. And the tethering is further aggravated by the loss of disc height and repetitive microtrauma onto the nerve. And that leads us into so-called instability, instability in the spine. I think most of us here have had kids. We all know about building blocks. That's instability when the little kid knocks over a bunch of blocks. Here, you've got lots of ligaments and facet joints keeping the spine in some form of alignment. If you lose disc height, you then get, if you like, a soggy disc. You get abnormal micro-movements, and then that brings the facet joint into conjunction with the nerve, producing pain. And so instability is actually that catch symptom. As your patient gets up to leave the surgery, oh, they catch in front of you and you think, poor thing. And what's happening is that facet joint is just catching onto the nerve. And those causes of hypertrophic facet joints, ligament tethering, may have been gradually building up over a number of years and are not painful until some incident occurs. They trip over the cat, they step down too hard off the stairs or the curb, and then they set up a little hematoma, and the whole vicious circle starts, you get the inflammation, and the pain treated early by your physiotherapist can usually be reduced. But if it becomes more chronic, then you're going to find it difficult. And of course, my colleagues will then treat that by fusion to raise the disc height, to take away the movement. What we're trying to do here is to maintain the movement, improve that control of the segment by physiotherapy, and there's no need to fuse the level and thereby increase the stress rises of the levels above. So looked up at another way, here is Madame La Guillotine sitting here. Here's the nerve coming out. Then we have the impacting facet joint here. So if that nerve is tethered to the facet joint, it's going to be held there and hit by the facet joint acting as a hammer. So that's if you have, and then if you have tethering between the nerve and the disc itself, the nerve can't escape. As the scarring matures, so it shortens, and it then brings this nerve, instead of coming out in its proper pathway, increasingly medially, diminishing something called the safe working zone, this triangle between the dura and the exiting nerve. And as it becomes more medialized, so it comes into the pathway of the, nerve, uh, of the facet joint and becomes repetitively bruised. So, Nerve distortion by the underlying disc will be called a cause of pain. Then we have the facet joint nerve tethering and impaction. So you've got this double whammy going on. The dorsal root ganglion becomes irritated. And we then make it worse by doing surgery 
nearby and adding to the overall scarring. So looked at another way, um, we've all been brought up to understand that a disc protrusion at that level will be causing irritation of that nerve, and that's where the problem is. Well, it isn't always as simple as that. The level below may be having impaction from the superior foraminal ligament, from the ascending facet joint, from small disc protrusions out in the foramen, and sometimes osteophytes sitting there. We call them shoulder osteophytes. And they sit in the front of the nerve. They're very difficult to see on the CT scan or MRI scan. But when you're in there you, and you mobilize the nerve, you can feel the little spike of bone sitting in the front of the nerve. Why it occurs, I don't really know. It's partly because the disc weakens particularly at the posterolateral angles, pulls on the bone at that level and produces very small osteophytes. And it may be aggravated by the effect of the facet joint beginning to push into that area via the nerve. And the whole lot may be augmented by the presence of a leaking disc or high intensity zone. So Let's look at this as a fairly typical example. Here is a patient who has memory pain. Memory pain. <laughs> How many of your hip patients, your knee patients, who have a, a successful hip or knee operation have memory pain? We have memory pain because we're not very good at diagnosing what's going on. And in fact, memory pain, I believe, is because we're missing an ongoing source of pain in the foramen, which is upsetting the dorsal root ganglion, which is why you then get this whole concept of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity only exists because there is a long-term repetitive irritant stimulating the cells in the dorsal root ganglion. So this patient had pe memory pain, um, pain over the sacroiliac joint, and it had oodles of injections into the sacroiliac joint. But in fact, when we came to touch the patient, we were able to see that the pain was coming from both 4-5 and 5-S1. And I don't know if you can see it, but the exiting nerve here is trapped and tethered to the upper pedicle at that superior foraminal ligament and also tethered onto the disc. And this poor patient, in fact, had it at both levels. Here you can see the nerve tethered to the disc and tethered to the superior foraminal ligament. Sometimes we bump into things that oughtn't to be there. And this is the nerve sitting here. This lady showed uh, or bred great St. Bernard dogs, and you can guess that she was four foot eight. So the dogs were taller than she was. So we removed that, uh, we mobilized the nerve first, removed that a few days later, and she's still showing dogs at Crufts, now without pain. And that is a blue stained disc, and that little mouth there is a radial tear. And you'll sometimes see it on some MRI scan reports. I'm afraid many radiologists don't report it because they don't believe that the reader has any interest in them. The problem is that the radial tear may be kept open by the breakdown products and debris coming into that little tear. So when you come to treat it, you must remove that at the same time as removing the underlying breakdown products and causal agents. So here's another case. This is a, a diabetic with a pacemaker on warfarin. And you're going to see when that moves that it's fairly typical that we've lost disc height here and lost disc height here. Here's the nerve coming out at that level and then that level and then that level. And because these are hypomobile, that patient is hinging particularly at that level. So we're getting foraminal compression, and I don't know with this system if I can get it to do it again. 
the patient is hinging here and trapping and nipping at that level. So what did we do? We, there was no, gel, no leak at that level, so we put in gel sticks, which is a polyacrylonitrile, which absorbs acids and slows down degeneration within the disc, and also serves by expansion to raise disc height. So if you like, it's going to cool that disc and help to preserve its function, because we're never going to really recreate function much here. At this level, there were a certain amount of symptoms, not the main severe symptoms, but they went into the territory of the presenting uh, complex. And we decompressed that level. And at this level, where there were much more severe symptoms, not only did we carry out a full foraminoplasty, mobilizing the nerve root, opening up the doorway, removing all the scarring and the ligaments, we then went into the disc and lasered that and then shrank the back wall of that disc with the heat of the laser called an annuloplasty. Now you can take the same concept in patients with spondylolytic spondylolisthesis. Instead of having to um, fuse that level, in an adult they're not going to slip further. They've already adjusted, they've thickened all their ligaments. Whoops and um, the body has adapted to it, and usually what has happened is you've hardly got any disc left here, but you've got a very, very strong posterior disc wall, very thick, and you don't really want to disturb that too much. And then by taking off the bone of the healed fracture site off the nerve and mobilizing the descending S1 at that level, you can treat the patient without the, mean, the need for fusion. And that we published many years ago. So for the last 20 odd years, we've been doing sing predominantly single level for raminoplasty because that's all we could do with the technology available. And we have been improving that. And we're now into doing combination for raminoplasty. Here's another case. Here at this level, the patient had a leaking disc. There's the nerve coming out. There's the dehydrated black disc. That was treated with a laser discectomy and shrinking the back wall. Um, then at this level, I don't know if you can see on the screen, but can you see the white area in the back wall of the disc? That's a high intensity zone. And it, the breakdown products are causing a lot of scarring and irritation, which you can see here in the foramen. So that level was dealt with with a full foraminoplasty. And this one, the nerve was tethered to the disc, so we, sorry, it sounds like a royal we, it's a big team in theater, isn't it? So the, we all carried out a foraminoplasty to mobilize the nerve, but didn't need to damage the situation further by taking out disc, but we put gel sticks in there as well. So there are lots of different combinations that we can do. When you're thinking, well, what's this really going to do to my practice? Well, for us, the, the philosophy is different. We need to find the source of the pain and then just remove the causal agents as minimally as possible. And we can apply that to protrusions and extrusions and sequestra because we can go into the epidural space, find the sequestra, and take it out through the side door. With spondylolisthesis, we can open up the doorway, take the pressure of the bone and the spikes and the ligaments off the exiting nerve root, and treat foraminal <coughs> and well, foraminal stenosis in the same way. You will bump into axial stenosis or canal stenosis. Well, a lot of those patients, the canal stenosis, for the most part, is a combination of facet joint hypertrophy and disc protrusion and ligament, ligamentum flavum infolding from the back. So you get this triple uh, concertinary or constriction of the epidural space. If you just remove the disc protrusion, you can make quite a considerable difference to that volume, especially if you play around with things like pi r squared. You'll see a very small difference in that anterior wall 
dimension will make a huge difference to the axial volume. The other thing to bear in mind in many of these patients who are getting fairly elderly is that their body has again adjusted. The nerves have adjusted to being progressively constricted. So if you can give them a small amount of uh, axial increment, then they will do quite well. So um, then there's failed back surgery. So patients who've had a failed microdiscectomy, everybody's very reluctant to go in again and do anything about it. But you have to ask why the, the discectomy has failed. OK, the recurrence rate for disc protrusions in microdiscectomy ranges in the papers between 3 and, I'm afraid, 13%. If you've got a sizable recurrence, you can go back in through the side door, go into the side of the disc, take out the disc protrusion and get, get out through the side door without having to traverse the epidural space and all the scarring that will be there. In cases where you've had, say, a failed fusion, you'd think, gosh, there's nothing else you can do there, but there is, because why has the fusion failed? It's failed because Either the nerves are retethered subsequent to the fusion or the total disc replacement, or they were never released in the first place. So by walking up the nerve and looking and seeing what's going on, you, the patient will tell you on the table whether you've done something to relieve their condition. Of course, in some cases, you, the most difficult of these are those where there's a cage that's slightly misplaced or a total disc replacement and, or caging, intervertebral caging that's been done through the anterior approach where disc material has been left behind, behind the cage and is therefore protruding. So you have to be very careful how you chamfer off that protrusion without exposing the disc replacement or cage. Then again, high intensity zones we can treat by going into the disc and lasering. N now, I used to have lots of arguments with my colleagues about laser disc decompression, and the concept was that 1,250 joules of laser energy put into the disc would reduce the pressure inside the disc by 50%. And I used to say, well, no, I don't believe that, because the moment the patient stands up, the pressure's back. But patients got better. Not all of them, and it's only really on its own useful for broad-based uh, disc protrusions in disc heights of 4 millimeters or more. But patients do get better from that. And I think there's actually more than one thing going on. I think one of the things that happens is, A, you're going to reduce the bulk of breakdown products being produced. The second is that you'll shrink the posterior wall so you won't have so much compression directly onto the nerve. But something else, you're probably very aware of papers coming out from Denmark talking about propionobacter and treating back pain with antibiotics. And they've have claimed some very good results. I've tried using it in my practice too. Not in many patients, but I find the patients find it very difficult to tolerate the antibiotic regimen, first of all. And I'm still not quite sure that I've got anybody better that way. But the jury is out. But laser discectomy sterilizes the inside of those discs. So maybe that's why laser discectomies have been useful for all these years. And there are hundreds of thousands of patients now around the world who've had laser discectomies. And finally, of course, patients who have adult scoliosis, very few of them are progressing. I've only seen one progress over this period of time. But if you again go for the source of the pain, you can treat that without them having to have an aggressive fusion or be I'm afraid, sent on just for chronic pain management and a really degraded retirement life. And the treatments that we have in hand are the, the full foraminoplasty or endoscopic uh, intradiscal discectomy or laser discectomy and gel sticks at adjacent levels or combinations of, of all three or four techniques. Well, is it any good? Well, first of all, you've got to look at the papers and the outcome criteria that they use. A lot of centers, especially in America, use the McNabb outcome, which is very soft. Um, a lot of centers over here use the Oswestry Disability Index, 
which is, uh, it, it, which is good, and then there's the Roland Morris score as well. But nobody really has defined what is success. They look at a 10 or 20% difference, or they look at the improvement in leg pain after microdiscectomy, or back pain after fusion, but seldom do they report on the combinations. So we asked 150 of our patients in the Spinal Foundation, have we really helped you? And they came back to us and really taught us to look at this in three zones. The back, the buttocks uh, and thigh, and groin as another level, and symptoms below the knee. If we cleared their symptoms, of course, that was an excellent result. But we, they only told us that we had had a good effect on them if we had at least halved their back pain, halved their leg pain, and halved their below knee pain. So that was our definition, which we took from them. Satisfactory meant we could achieve that in at least two of those zones, and poor was if we didn't meet the 50% barrier in any one of those levels and worse if they were obviously made worse. So looking at our single level treatment for aminoplasties, um, we've been reporting on that for some time now, and our experience is that in earlier days, 70% of my patients were failed back surgery. Because I was doing something off the wall, I wasn't getting nice virginal backs. I was getting much more difficult cases. The great advantage of the technique is it's transagist, and because we're operating on the patients under sedation, it, the comorbidities are less relevant. And our first papers have shown that the success rate, as defined as excellent or good, was achieved in 80% of patients at two to four years. We've just published now our 10-year result. It's all been peer-reviewed, and we have a 72% success rate at 10 years and no destabilization of the spine. And therefore, one may say that this technique offers you quite good prophylactic protection for your patients. In terms of complications, um, it's three times less comp well, prone to complications than microdiscectomy, seven times less prone than fusion. But more importantly, it's an order less severe. And for instance, in the first 958 cases, which included my development curve, my learning curve, we had eight recurrent protrusions. In a current audit, now 4,350 for rhamnoplasties that I've done, and 3,500 plus uh, laser discectomies. We've had nine infections and seven dural tears. Very sadly, we had two last Christmas, but we ruined the figures. But um, the return to work, we tend to hold the patients back a little bit and limit that to four to six weeks because um, we're working through a very small hole. And if they tend to overdo their activity levels too soon, they will make that nerve swell. You saw how red it was. It's very prone to expand and swell in a tiny hole, and they'll get a recurrence of their symptoms. And it can be very disabling. So we tend to artificially hold them back. And in terms of combination therapy, which is now what we're expanding up to do, uh, we would do at the prime level uh, for pain production, full for raminoplasty. Then at the next level, we would do more of an endoscopic for raminotomy, just with a much lesser extensive procedure. And at the third level, a laser discectomy or annuloplasty. And at the fourth level, perhaps insert gel stick. So we're now able to treat really some quite horrendous spines. And in terms of outcome, we've just done a survey of those over the last uh, two years in 80 patients. And you'll see that it's various combinations of foraminotomy, foraminoplasty, and laser discectomy. And in this catchment group, 40% had failed back surgery. The age range was 46 to 89. 
There were no DVTs or the standard complications. And 20 out of that 80 were completely pain-free, despite multi-level interventions here. 33 had a good result, so they were, all their pain was at least halved. And then there were 24 who were satisfactory. We hadn't quite got it in all three levels. And there were three which were poor, but none that we found were worse. So in summary, with regard to endoscopic minimally invasive spine surgery, um, I think you can recommend foraminoplasty. Please bear in mind it's not foraminotomy. It's not just going in there making a big hole. It's going there making a very discreet hole and mobilizing the nerve as safely as possible. It seems to give uh, at least 10 year quite good results and it can be used for the failed back surgeries. It would be much better if we could get to the patients first and be the filter to reduce the amount of open surgery. We've already gone over the number, the applications for this surgery and importantly it's very useful for the aged and infirm. It's also a vehicle, I believe, for stem cell disc replacement, which is what we've been working on now for some 12 years. So now for something slightly different. Vertebral compression fractures. You'll see lots of osteoporotic patients in your practices. And whilst this technique is new to us in England, it has been around in Europe for some time. I'm told that there's some 10,000 patients who've been treated with this technique. And it's useful for patients who've had, who are much younger, who've had tra real trauma. Uh, but we won't touch that today. We'll just look at uh, osteoporosis. So looking at vertebral compression fractures, they have clinical consequences and biochemical, uh, sorry, biomechanical consequences. And clinically, this is, of course, pain in its various presentations with physiological complications when they lose their posture. The patients will get respiratory and GI system problems and reduce vital capacity. And then, of course, various compressions of nerves, either in the, uh, in the spinal canal through retropulsion of fragments or directly on nerves as they exit the thoracic or lumbar spine from the fragments or the disc. And then you get loss of sagittal balance and coronal balance and <coughs> aggravated disc degeneration and facet joint strain and therefore arthropathy. So obviously when you're trying to sort out this patient, you must look at their bone quality, perhaps using a DEXA scan or biopsy. With CT scan, you need to type the fracture and particularly the MRI scan to look at the T2 sequences. So for the bone quality, you need to look at to see if the pathology is severe or mild. Is it osteoporosis or osteopenia? How much trauma was involved? And of course, is there actually a tumor present? We won't go into the fracture classification and, but what matters is how fresh is that fracture. Now the normal teaching is to use these devices, whether it be any of the systems available, you should be treating the patient within six weeks. And the purpose of the T2 scan is to look at the presence of a hematoma in the vertebral body or edema. So in terms of pain treatment, uh, Fixation is the center of where we're trying to go here. If we can take out the micro-movement, theoretically, we should be reducing the pain. There are several schools of thought. Uh, there are many who would prefer just to treat these patients with conservative measures, um, perhaps physiotherapy, even braces, and so on. Personally, I don't subscribe to that, but I am a surgeon. And I think the intravertebral technique done with the patient awake is very simple and you'll see the benefits that come for it. If you have a tumor 
or multiple level collapse, then you may want to add posterior fixation to it with pedicle screws, but this is quite rare. This is more common in the younger patient who's had major trauma. And in terms of anatomical restoration, we must try and correct not only the sagittal balance, but the coronal balance, i.e. if the patient is tilted off to the side, restore the height in the disc, and try and reposition the end plates as much as possible, and particularly to try and draw forwards the retropulsed fragments that have gone into the epidural space. So end plate fracture isn't, is important because it then allows oxygen into the disc. The disc is an anaerobic uh, entity. And if it becomes aerobic, then degeneration is accelerated. And in terms of sagittal balance, if you don't increase the, or restore that disc height, you can overload the adjacent levels by as much as 94%. So you're going to see this creeping collapse, and there's an awful picture you see outside nursing homes of somebody walking forwards like this, which actually was drawn by a little girl many years ago. But that is occurring because the poor patient is suffering multi-level uh, osteoporotic collapse, and maybe if we had intervened earlier and corrected that, we might have stopped that cascade of degeneration and collapse. And you can see here, when you have the <clears throat> the collapse anteriorly, how the weight-bearing line is brought forwards and it overloads the front of the already collapsed disc and upsets its neighbours, but also has these effects upon the remainder of the body. With the net result that you'll get uh, loss of lung capacity, pulmonary diseases, increased chest infections, etc., from sheer pain and posture, further reduction in mobility in patients who, as they get older, have more atrophic muscles. Then you'll get adjacent fractures, height loss, weight loss, and urinary retention and infections. So the treatments are, have really cascaded over a number of years. We used to do, or our radiological colleagues would be doing vertebroplasty, which is putting a needle into the disc, sorry, into the vertebra and injecting polymethyl methacrylate cement, in commas, plastic. Or, in younger people, certain biomaterials. Then came along kyphoplasty, where we would go in and put a balloon in, which would then restore the disc height. But the balloon goes in many directions, so you're not controlling uh, that restoration process. And the technique that I think is very intriguing, I don't have a lot of experience with it yet, but it does seem to tick a number of boxes, is this spine jack, where the end plates, which are flexible, so they don't damage the end plate, um, can be organized specifically within fractures to pick up fracture elements and it's just like a car jack. It restores the disc, uh, the vertebral height and then the polymethyl methacrylate is pumped down here and out through the a little hole in the middle there. So the problem with vertebroplasty, you probably have heard of white lung disease, the polymethyl methacrylate monomer, gets into the veins and lands in the lungs, they look awful on the x-ray, and the patient is then suffering with shortness of breath, and it doesn't give you sagittal correction, and it has very suboptimal integration into the elements of that fracture. I used to do quite a lot of uh, kyphoplasty, I think it's very interesting, but at the end of the day, you've got a little marble in the middle of this vertebral body, which can eventually loosen, and because it hasn't integrated very extensively, the bone, the cancellous bone around it, will resorb and it becomes loose, and then you get loss of disc height, so you lose your restoration. And it has limited application. You can't use it so easily in the fractures in younger patients or more severe trauma. And I think it suffers with incomplete integration 
and it, the restoration fails over time. Well, here you have the, uh, the spine jack insertion system, and you can guide these into various points within a fracture site. And then the concept is that you use the axis down the pedicle to stabilize the jack as it is wound up and the end plate is restored. But at the same time, you get this traction through the posterior longitudinal ligament of the fragments which are digging into the epidural space. So I'm going just to sh try and morph that for you. Um, you see the jack pumping up but something more important, now the cement PMMA is going in, but if you wait, you'll see how it comes out, and because you haven't compressed the area with your balloon, that polymethyl methacrylate can go into various elements of the cancellous bone and get you, theoretically, better integration, and hopefully, longer term hold. So, the system gives you better control of craniochordal restoration. The biomaterial, or PMMA, integrates more extensively within the vertebra. You can do more complex fractures. And there is a widespread European experience. And if you look at the papers, the claims are of good long-term effects. And it appears that the restoration is sustained. So let's just end by looking at a clinical example. This is a lady of 94, uh, has had a rather complex little presentation which might be uncomfortable, it was, certainly had me thinking. Um, she'd had back pain for 10 years, her symptoms were aggravated by sitting, eased by the fetal position. The left leg became prone to co collapse in January of this year. By March, she had terrible back pain and a lumbar extension catch as she got out of a chair. And she started developing an increasing stoop and increasing claudication and increasing back, back ache. Now that could have done for a nasty disc protrusion because this was in the lumbar spine. So anyhow, long story short, she had the spine jack inserted on the 10th of May and I don't know if this shows, but this was the first scan I saw, first set of x-rays and scan, which actually shows the inferior end plate pushing upwards into um, a very edematous vertebra. And I was always taught, that beware of that, that is a sign of a tumor. Because most of these vertebral body collapses tend to be from above downwards, as you know. And here you see the CT scan. And this is, forgive me, it takes a little time, this, because it's very, very important to get these, if you like, guide wires in the right place. This is being done under local anesthetic. There's one pedicle, there's the other. And having looked at the structure of that fracture, I, want, I knew where I wanted to place these. So now we're getting the alignment correct. And there's two of these going in when you look in the lateral. So they have to be balanced. And now there's the second guide. Now we're going to core out a little bit of bone here so that we can put the spine jack into position. And now coring out the other side. And now that's the first spine jack going in, flat. And then the second one is now in, and now we're winding it up as if we're at the roadside. And you'll see this inferior end plate beginning to improve. And the flexibility of the plates of the, hijack, uh, of the <laughs> spine jack. And unfortunately, she had quite a nasty uh, end plate fracture there and a little bit of the PMMA has come through but it didn't go to the posterior wall and you can see how it's inosculated laterally and fully 
where I wanted it to go. And that lady is, uh, went to her daughter for two to three weeks. She left the next morning, two to three weeks, and is now back in her uh, supervised residential care, very independent, apparently. She hasn't even felt it necessary to come for a follow-up. Thank you.